From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. This week's story, The Case of the Bleeding Chandelier. Well, here we are once more in Dr. Watson's familiar study. Outside, a drowsy June day is drawing to a close. It's too warm to do anything but just sit and relax. There's a fine mood that is, Mr. Harris. However, I know two things that I think will snap you out of it. Well, what's that, Dr. Watson? Well, the first is the adventure which Sherlock Holmes always referred to as the case of the bleeding chandelier. Uh, a bleeding chandelier, Doctor? Quite. It was made of old Russian silver, and whenever a catastrophe was due to happen to any one of the house of Mortlake, the chandelier was supposed to shed tears of blood. Well, do I remember sitting in the crumbling old banqueting hall of Mortlake Castle, listening to the ominous beat of the sea on the cliffs outside, and waiting, waiting for the first spatter of blood. Yes, I think that story may just possibly help to dispel the heat. <laughs> I'll say so. I'm feeling chills up and down my spine already, Doctor. Oh, good, but that isn't going to keep me from giving you my second suggestion about making the summer heat bearable. Now, Dr. Watson, you wouldn't by any chance be leading up to a few remarks about that new tropical weight clipper craft suit you're wearing? And why not? Yes, sir, it not only feels cool, unlike most tropicals, it keeps its shape. It stays neat and natty. In short, ship shape. To use your own expression, Dr. Watson. Right, Mr. Harris. And you know, when you look crisp and tidy, it helps you feel cool and comfortable. It certainly does. And clipper craft prices won't raise your temperature either. Remember that. When things proceed according to plan, it means efficiency. When clothing is made according to plan, it means the same thing. The clipper craft plan is dedicated to just one thing. Giving you the best clothing values possible. If you join the millions who insist on clothes made according to the Clippercraft plan, you buy high quality Clippercraft suits for only 40 to 4750, fine tropicals for only 3375 to 40 dollars, and sport jackets for only 2650. Such values would not be possible unless they were planned values. In the Clippercraft plan, 1036 of the nation's finest independent stores voluntarily concentrate their buying power to provide steady year-round operation, to reduce manufacturing and distribution costs in order to deliver the savings to you. In days like these, every penny you save is important to your budget. So, may we suggest that you compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, back to Mortlake Castle, and the chandelier that shed tears of blood. Or uh, did it refuse to live up to its reputation? As a matter of fact, yes. It was rather curious blood, as it turned out. Hmm. Uh, but to me, get at the beginning. Uh, let me see. It was a murky midsummer day in the late 90s. When Holmes came into breakfast, he found a large envelope addressed in a scrawling, rather flamboyant hand and with a decidedly grandiose purple seal affixed to the back flap. Watson. Oh, Holmes, I thought you were never going to get up. I see there's a tremendously important-looking letter waiting for you. Really? A communication from the court chamberlain, I presume, telling me I'm to be knighted. Oh, don't be an ass. And what's so asinine about that? What did I do with my tobacco? Plenty of pompous non-entities without one-tenth my brains have managed to get themselves on the honors list. Confound that tobacco pouch. Where is it? Oh, never mind your tobacco pouch. Here, have a cigar and sit down and open your mail. Oh, Thank you, Watson. Yes, your practice must be improving. Your cigars are becoming quite respectable. Yes, quite respectable. Holmes, you old fraud. I don't think for one minute you mislaid your tobacco pouch. There it is in the pocket of your dressing gown. Well, well so it is. Now, fancy that. Yes, you were just <laughs> trying to wangle one of my new cigars. I, I say, how in blazes did you know I'd been given a box of Corona Coronas? <laughs> My dear Watson, the Morning Times lists the birth of another son to Mr. Harridge, the hair tonic millionaire, and to Mrs. Harridge, too, of course. 
He always gives you Corona Coronas on these occasions. Holmes, will you stop blithering and open that letter? Dear, dear, impatient this morning, aren't we? Yes, Watson, you're as anxious and high-strung as any prospective father when you think you see a new case in the offing. Holmes, will you please open... Very well, very well. Now, what have we here? The postmark says Mort's Bay. That's in North Devon, if I'm not mistaken. No, for once you're correct. I believe Mortlake Castle overlooks Mort's Bay. Correct again. Your average is rising, Watson. Well, then the letter must be from Lord Roger Mortlake, the seventh Baron Embers. Only the man who's head of the family would have such a dashing handwriting and would seal his letters with a family crest. <sighs> Back to normal, Watson. What do you mean? In the first place, it's not the Mortlake seal. It's a much newer crest, the one invented by the late Samuel Pridgett, first Baron Waterhole, the ginger beer tycoon. Furthermore, the letter was written by a woman, his widow to be exact, so you're wrong on both counts. However, it was sent from Mortlake Castle, where it seems Lady Pridgett is visiting. Well, what does the old girl want? Us, Watson. Or more specifically, me. You may come along if you can manage to tear yourself away from the Harridges and their progeny. Uh, what's up at Mo uh, Castle Mortlake? Here, read the letter for yourself. Mm. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'm not easily intimidated. However, when I find a note pinned to my pillow which reads... Beware, if you proceed with a marriage, the chandelier will drip blood. In such an event, Mr. Holmes, I deem it wise to seek counsel and possibly protection. Will you come to Mortlake as my guest, incognito, of course? I shall introduce you as my cousin, Sherwood Jones. I suggest you arrive at Barnstable by the 310 on Thursday. I myself shall meet you. The walls of this old mausoleum called Mortlake Castle have many ears, it seems... However, the drive to the castle is a long one. I shall be able to give you all the details of a thoroughly sinister situation in the privacy of the carriage. Furthermore, the family coachman is quite deaf. Do come and relieve the anxiety of a troubled woman. Yours in desperation, Amelia, Lady Pridget. P.S. I understand you have a medical secretary or helper. By all means, fetch him along. He can be my husband's cousin, Dr. Botsom. Well, I refuse to be called Botsam. <laughs> Very well, then. Stay and minister to the Harridges. Personally, I shall go and pack. Yes, we haven't too much time if we're to catch today's train. I say, Holmes, if, uh, if there's a wedding house party at Mortlake Castle, it should be all rather posh, eh? Shall we take white tie or black, do you think? Huh? You may take your entire trousseau, my dear Watson. Personally, I shall be content with a rather complete chemical kit and your army revolver. <laughs> See, these old family carriages are quite comfortable and roomy, eh, Holmes? We shall be lucky if this ancient omnibus doesn't fall apart before we return to Castle Mortlake. Yes, I gather, Lady Pridget, that it's been in the family for some time. It has indeed, Mr. Holmes. It's the famous old Berlin in which Roger's great-great, well, I can't remember how many greats, grandfather made his famous grand tour of Europe. It took him three years, I believe. He even went as far as St. Petersburg. That's where the trouble began. What trouble, Lady Pridget? Well, the young fool met a Princess Orloff and fell head over heels in love with her. It seems she was a favourite godchild of Catherine the Great. Lord Mortlake managed to marry her and they returned to England with an enormous Russian wolfhound and that cursed silver chandelier in this very carriage. This um, chandelier, I take it, Lady Pridget, is the same one which is now supposed to drip blood whenever there's to be a catastrophe of the Mortlake family. That's right, Mr. Holmes. When is this uh, colourful phenomenon first supposed to have occurred? Well, it all began with the death of the Russian princess herself. She had a bit of a temper, it seems. No one could polish her silver chandelier to suit her. She had the habit of hitting anyone who didn't please her with a nasty little riding whip. One morning, there was a new red-headed girl up on a ladder working away at the silver chandelier when her ladyship swept into the banquet hall. One look and the Russian burst into her usual torrent of rage. She hit the redhead across the face. Now, it so happened the girl was Irish. And if there's a stronger temperament in this world than the Russian, sure, it's the Irish. <laughs> right you are there. Well, Bridget or Nora, or whatever her name was, snatched the little whip from her mistress's hand, and then looking her straight in the eye, she laid on her the terrible strangler's curse of Donegal. Then she strode from the room and slammed the great door after her. Good for her. The Russian could be heard screaming that she'd polish the chandelier herself. They heard her bolt the door. All afternoon, she could be heard laughing and singing wild Cossack songs. As evening came on, the singing ceased. 
The Russian princess didn't appear at the supper table, but no one dared go fetch her. As the evening wore on, her wolfhound began to whimper outside the locked door. Shortly before midnight, he started to howl. Finally, Lord Mortlake could stand it no longer. It's midnight. She sulked long enough. I I'm going in after her. Quiet, Boris. Down, boy. Sonia! Sonia, let us in! Sonia, unbolt the door! Sonia! Confound the woman. We shall have to break in the door. Boris, stop that. The door's heavy. We need a battering ram. Uh, bring that long bench. That's it. Let you do the trick. Now then. One. Two. Three. Yeah, that's done it. Good Lord, it's black in there. Sonia, come out. Sonia, do you hear me? Someone give me the torch. Oh, Boris, what's the matter? The animal's trembling like a leaf. Oh, hand me the torch. That's better. Now then, we'll see. The ladder's lying on the floor. Good Lord. The chandelier. She's hanging from the chandelier. She's strangled by her own hair. <laughs> Well, that was the end of the Russian princess, Mr. Holmes. Of course, she had thoughtfully provided the Mortlakes with an heir before her fatal accident. And consequently, there is a streak of violent Russian blood in the present inhabitants of Mortlake Castle, I take it. Right, Mr. Holmes. And whenever there's to be a death in the family, that blood is supposed to flow from the Russian chandelier. Personally, after Roger and I are married, I shall insist he get rid of the ugly eyesore. Yes, and I shall see he buys a new carriage, too. He pretends the family still uses this ancient relic for sentimental reasons, but everyone knows it's because he can't afford a new one. Well, you look shocked, Dr. Watson. No, 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 not at all. I... To be brutally frank, gentlemen, it is the accepted opinion in all the drawing rooms and public houses of Devonshire that I am marrying Lord Roger Mortlake for his social position, and he is marrying me for my money. Well, I'm sure that... Uh, it's well, a... they're wrong, Dr. Watson. Roger and I have been in love ever since we first attended Miss Hermione Tilsbury's dancing classes. We should have been married 20 years ago, but his father broke off the match. You see, we were both as poor as church mice, and it takes a whacking amount of money to run Mortlake Castle. Well, one of the blessings of being nobody, eh, Holmes? Uh, you can marry to suit yourself. Don't interrupt, Watson. The irony of the situation, Mr. Holmes, is that Roger was persuaded to marry one of the Burdock girls, whose father was supposed to have quids. The father managed to go through his fortune shortly afterwards and died bankrupt. Mm, poetic justice, eh, Holmes? I, on the other hand, married Henry, married Henry Pridget, a, a jolly, good-natured little man with no prospects whatever. And he up and acquired millions. Dear Henry, we had a very pleasant life together. Mm. So now you're determined to marry your first love. Mm, we females are curiously single-minded creatures, Mr. Holmes. It's always dangerous to frustrate a woman. Quite. Tell me, Lady Pridget, is there anyone at Mortlake Castle who's opposed to your marriage to Lord Roger Mortlake? Quite a few, I should imagine, Mr. Holmes. The First Lady Mortlake's personal maid, old Buffum. She glares at me as if I were a mongrel that had wandered in off the streets. And James, he's Roger's son. He resents the fact that we didn't wait at least two years after his mother's death. The girls, I must say, are more realistic. Possibly because they realize my money will buy them quite a few social opportunities they should not otherwise enjoy. Yes, on the whole, I have more respect for James's attitude. Although I shall pay it no heed, mind you. I quite understand. And then, of course, there's Hubert. He's Roger's younger brother, still a bachelor at 57. He's the only one that's really enthusiastic about the match. But then I've always been able to wind Hubert around my little finger. Even more easily than Lord Roger? Oh, good heavens, yes. Roger's a mule. And besides that, he has principles. He absolutely refused to run away with me 20 years ago, and I had the devil of a time persuading him to propose after we were both free again. He has scruples about accepting my money, it seems. I finally pointed out that it was pure selfishness. 
He might enjoy being a pauper and watching Motley Castle crumble over his head, but was it fair to the children? And uh, that persuaded him? Well, of course, I was wearing my new Paris shirtwaist at the time, the one with the peekaboo bodice. <coughs> I see. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. I must warn you about one thing, gentlemen. There's to be the usual big wedding rehearsal dinner at the banquet hall tonight. The Motleys are great ones for drinking toast. Oh, bridal champagne and all that, eh? Jolly, eh, Holmes? Champagne, my foot. At Mortlake Castle, toasts are drunk in Mortlake Mead. And the recipe for it goes back to their Saxon ancestors. Look out for it, I warn you. It's liquid dynamite. Ah, yes, mead. Or metheglin, to use the ancient term, was a drink supposed to promote health, long life, and uh, vitality. It's made from honey. I'm a bit of a bee fancier myself, you know. Oh, then you'll have something in common with Hubert. He takes care of the bees at Mortlake. Won't let anyone else go near the hives. Not that anyone wants to. Heaven knows. The bees at Mortlake are notoriously short-tempered. Interesting. I shall see if I can't persuade you, but... Oh, dear. Oh, what's up? Something's frightened the horses. Oh, dear. Look, they're running away. Oh. No, the coachman has them under control. He stopped the carriage. What's the trouble, Benjamin? Oh, dear. I keep forgetting he's deaf. He's getting down off the box. Mr. Holmes, there's something lying in the road up ahead. The driver's gone to investigate. It's getting so dark, I can't wait. Watson, can't... you stay out here with Lady Bridget. I'll go and see if Benjamin needs help. Hmm, wind rising. That pounding up ahead, that will be the sea. It must be close to Mortlake Castle. Yes, let's see what we've got. Lantern! Benjamin, give me the lantern. I... Hmm. A sheep. Quite dead. Still bleeding. Nasty series of gashes across the throat. There be evil coming to Mortlake. It's a sign. When that Russian ghost dog comes back and kills a sheep, it's a sure sign. Mark my word. Tonight the chandelier will drip blood. <laughs> Men take real pride in the Clippercraft label, for not alone is it the mark of fine quality, it's proof positive that you're alert enough to get the most for your money. Few have the follow through that makes really great values possible. The famous Clippercraft plan, our follow through, literally assures you of satisfaction. Through it, you get the benefit of great savings made by the fact that 1036 of the nation's finest independent stores from coast to coast have voluntarily concentrated their buying power. It's the reason your Clippercraft dealer shows you such remarkably fine quality in suits for only forty to forty-seven fifty in tropicals for only thirty-three seventy-five to forty dollars and in sport jackets for only twenty-six fifty. For selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, sport jackets, and tropicals. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica... The B&B &B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Mort Lake Castle, where Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes, all done up in their stiffest shirts and highest colors, are being given a personally conducted tour around the castle by its future mistress, Lady Pridget. And this is the banquet hall. Good Lord, it's enormous. Mm, the early Mortlakes took their banqueting seriously, it seems. That's the old maid, Buffum, arranging the flowers. Oh, uh, Buffum, you might draw the curtains and open the glass doors a moment. I want the gentleman to have a look at the view from this room. Obedient but grudging, eh, Holmes? The surf sounds ominous. Aye. There's a sound of doom in it tonight. You do well, my lady, to leave for there's harm done. What? What do you mean by that, Buffum? She's just trying to frighten me off. 
It won't work, my girl. It takes more than dead sheep, pounding surf and dripping chandeliers to get rid of me. That's all. You may close the doors and go. By the way, this, that is the chandelier, I take it. The enormous silver one near the great center window. That's right. Well, it's certainly spectacular. Hey, Holmes, must hold nearly a hundred candles. A hundred and twenty-two, to be exact. When they're all lit, it creates quite a show of light. And heat, too, I imagine. Hmm. Buffum expressing her disapproval. Well, I'm glad she's gone. She was giving me the fidgets. I see there's a ladder under the chandelier. Yes, they're about to light the stupid thing, I imagine. I think I'll just mount it and take a closer look if you've no objections. None at all. I'll hold it steady for you. Thank you, Lady Bridget. Yes, I thought I recognized it. You mean you've seen the chandelier before? No, it's twin sister in the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. It's supposed to have been made for Catherine the Great to uh, eliminate any suitors who had lost their charms. What do you mean by that? Both chandeliers are hollow. The one in St. Petersburg was so hung that boiling lead could be poured into it from the room above. It eventually found its way out of the mouths of these little silver dolphins and poured itself over the guest of honor seated below. Yes, the mouths of these particular dolphins seem to be stopped up, however. Well, thank heaven oh, for that. Oh, Balderdash, that chandelier doesn't reach to the ceiling. It's too high up. It's hung to a great hook by a long velvet cord. Yes, the cord looks rather frayed. Furthermore, there's no room above this. Nothing but that vaulted ceiling up there. Oh, if you think anyone can make the chandelier drip blood by crawling around on the roof, you're very much mistaken. Yes, it doesn't seem very practical. Who is due to sit at these places directly below the chandelier, Lady Bridget? Why, uh, well, that is well, Roger and I, I suppose. It's the head of the table, you know. Yes. Now, suppose we shift things around a bit. Help me, Watson. I hope. If we pull the table to one side... Uh, a little further, Watson. That's better. Yes. Now, if you'll seat Watson and myself to your left, Lady Pridget. Now we'll be directly under the chandelier. I say, Holmes, do you have to... Quiet, Watson. Someone's coming down the hall. Ah, there you are, Amelia, my dear. Roger's looking all over for you. They're having sherry in the pink drawing room. Oh, we'll go right along, you, but thank you for telling me. Uh, I was just showing my uh, cousins the chandelier. Oh, <laughs> how do you like the old monstrosity? To be quite frank, I don't. Neither do I. Ah, oh, well, I... I came in to light the candles on this silly thing. Mm. Tell me, Mr. Mortlake, do you believe this chandelier drips blood whenever there's to be a catastrophe in the family? Well, something of the sort did happen, you know, when my Uncle Edgar was drowned. Uh, I was quite young at the time and terribly impressed by the great brownish drops. Of course, looking back, I realized there was a terrific rainstorm and there may have been a leak in the roof and the water splattered through onto the chandelier and uh, gathered rust and dripped off or something of the sort. But it's a silver chandelier, Mr. Mortlake. Why, that's right, Hubert. Silver doesn't rust. Oh, oh, well, maybe there's some other explanation. I'd better start to light it or they'll be ready for dinner before I've finished. Our butler's getting old, you know. Let us give him vertigo, I'm afraid, so it's uh, up to me. Uh, may I help you? Let me take that silver pitcher you're uh, carrying. Thank you, no. I, uh, I'll i just put it here on the sideboard. It's the famous Mortlake Mead, you know. I was just decanting. Uh, but uh, you'd better run along, Amelia, and take along your cousins, my dear, or Roger will be wilting his collar out of sheer anxiety. <laughs> I say, Holmes, I hope you don't have to drink many more toasts. Uh, this mead is too dashed potent. Yes, it has what you might call authority. Oh, confound it, Holmes. Did you have to put us under the chandelier? Another drop of wax just splashed down my shirt front. Yes, but this time it's slightly brownish. Yes, the chandelier is really getting hot. Oh, wax doesn't turn brown with heat. This wax does, Watson. It's beeswax. Beeswax? Yes, but the candles are tallow. Interesting. Very interesting. What's so interesting about it? Oh, confound it, there's another blob on the back of my hand. Yes. Yes, it shouldn't be long now. <clears throat> and, uh, and now a toast to the happy couple. Oh, long God. life and uh, joy in the living. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, Amelia, my dear, I'm sure you'd like to say a few words. Well, Holmes, there's blood. Blood dripping on the tablecloth. Oh, well, look. The chandelier, it's bleeding. The chandelier! <laughs> Amelia, my dear, I do think you might have told us your guests were the famous Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, not pass them off as your cousins. Do be quiet, Hubert. 
Heavens, how long does it take the man to finish his chemical experiments? He looks like a great sinister raven crouched over that retort, with the light from that spirit lamp shining up into his eyes. I almost wish I hadn't asked him yes, to come. Yes, you may turn down the lamp, Watson. The tests are conclusive. Mr. Holmes, is it... is it blood? It is blood, Lady Bridget. Oh, dear. Not human blood, however. Sheep's blood. As a matter of fact, it's blood from the same sheep we saw on the road this evening. More blood from that sheep is spattered here on this Macintosh I found rolled up in a chest in the front hall. Roger! That's your Macintosh! Don't be alarmed, my dear Lady Bridget. Your fiancé hasn't stepped foot outside all day. The polish on all of his boots is quite untouched. The polish on Hubert Mortlake's brown Oxford has been splotched, however, by blood. Sheep's blood. It's quite easy to borrow a Macintosh, you know. Shoes, however, aren't so adaptable. You mean Hubert is responsible for the gory chandelier? What? Yes, Hubert. You filled the hollow interior with sheep's blood from that silver pitcher when you came in to light the candles. But why didn't it drip through at once? Because he had stopped up the silver dolphin's mouths with beeswax, which only melted from the heat of the candles after they'd been burning for some time. I suspected Hubert was up to something the moment I discovered the dolphin's mouth had been stopped with beeswax. Hubert, why did you do it? Because I've always loved you and hated Roger. <laughs> I was glad when Father made him marry that ugly Burdick girl. But you wouldn't look at me even then, me. Well, I made up my mind he'd never get you, never. And now I've lost. Out of my way! Everything's lost! He's running Stop along the tabletop. He's jumping the chandelier! He's swinging for the window! No, but look out! You're crashed! The rope's broken! It's crashed! The chandelier is you, but they crashed through the window! Gone over the cliff. He'll be pounded to death on the rocks. I'm afraid so. I warned you, my lady. I said it was the sound of doom. have a nice hot cup of soup handy, Dr. Watson. <laughs> no, but I, I can lend you my last winter's overcoat, Mr. Harris. <laughs> well, that was certainly a real old-fashioned chiller diller, Doctor. But now, could you give us a hint about next week's story? Well, let me see. Uh, next week uh, is the last broadcast of the season, Mr. Harris, so I think I'll pick a, a good old-fashioned hair razor. Fair enough. Yes, I think I'll tell about a, a double murder that occurred in Ronda's Circus. It concerned a clown and a savage lion and a certain strong man whose courage failed him at the crucial moment. Holmes always called it the adventure of the veiled lodger. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. John Stanley, known best to you as Sherlock Holmes, has turned author. Be sure to read his article, Powder Smoke at 221B Baker Street, in the current issue of Black Mask Magazine, now on your newsstand. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in... The Adventure of the Veiled Lodger. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.